Last time, Philip started his two-part sermon on Galatians 6.14 about boasting or glorying in the cross of Jesus. He covered some of the ways the Old Testament pointed to the crucifixion, and also how the Romans historically used various methods for crucifixions. Today, we proceed with part two. This time, we focus on why and how we boast and glory in the cross of our Savior. After all, that's what Paul said is all he wanted to do. Here's Philip Shields, part two. Well, hello, children of the highest, my brothers and sisters in the house of God. Uh, appreciate you coming and being here for this website. Today, as Scott said, we're going to continue the, the topic of boasting, glorying in the cross, stake the cross of our Savior, of Jesus Christ. And so I want to cover that today because uh, I don't think we just are. We just don't talk about it that much. Many of the very conservative Church of God groups and others who are Sabbath keepers uh, hardly talk about the cross at all because of conceptions that it is from pagan origin and all that. I covered a lot of that in part one. So please go back to part one and why uh, I've shown in my research that the cross could have been storos in Greek, could have been just an upright stake, or it could have been a T shape, or it could have been shaped as a cross beam cross, the more familiar one, or it could be an X, people just crucified as an X shape. But the, um, uh, we did a lot of that in part one. So anyway, um, we look at Galatians 6.14, that Paul says he wanted to boast in nothing, glory in nothing, except the cross of Yeshua, of Jesus Christ. And so please bow your heads, we'll ask God's blessing and presence on this service. Dear Father in heaven, we come before you, Abba, our Holy Father and Holy Yeshua, which means salvation. Thank you. We bow our heads to you as we come to the cross of Yeshua, where you, Yeshua, knock Satan out in the head, right at Golgotha, place of the skull. Frankly, we're in awe of you. We should be, and we are, in awe of you. We're amazed by what you did. Forgive us, Yeshua, for not esteeming your love enough in the past. King, Master, Savior, Lord, Lion of Judah, everything you are. Your blood ran red and washed our, our sins white as snow in your blood. You took our sins. You took upon yourself the shame that we had caused by our sins. And you took God's wrath that was on us because of our sins. And so much more. And you reconciled us and redeemed us. All those things which we'll talk about even more today and we did last time. Father, thank you for sending the word to be our Savior, to be uh, the token of your love and the evidence of your love. Help us be ready for Passover as it comes up, to be esteeming the body of Christ, his literal body and the body of Christ, the church, much more than we are. To come together, be one. Let us never doubt your love for us, that you will never, ever leave us or forsake us. And you're, you're, nothing can separate us from your love, just nothing. That's what you told Paul to say in Romans chapter 8. Send us down, Father, the Holy Anointing, Holy Spirit, as we speak now, and I just pray in Yeshua's mighty name that you will inspire the hearing, inspire the speaking to be exactly what you want as we commit this service into your hands. In Yeshua's mighty name and powerful name, amen and amen. We stand in awe of you, Yeshua. We stand in awe of you. I covered, last time I covered the instrument, last time I covered the instrument of his death in part one, because there are still so many who get hung up on whether or not it was a cross or a stake or some other thing or, tie, or attached to a tree, as is mentioned in the translations in so many places. But even I, for decades, did not, did not speak about the boasting in the cross. And as I looked at other websites and churches and so forth, especially Sabbath-keeping ones, conservative ones, I didn't find it there. I didn't find sermons about boasting in the cross. And I myself didn't do one, so I'm not castigating anybody, I'm castigating myself, that I should have been talking about it more. So this is my sermon on, uh, on the cross, boasting in it, glorifying in it, glorifying God in it. And uh, I showed last time how they crucified on X's, on trees, on T's, on cross beams. And what, when it says Jesus carried his cross, I guarantee you he did not carry the entire cross. He carried either one upright stake or guarantee you, based on historical accounts, that he would have carried a cross beam, most likely a cross beam that was then attached to either a tree or to an existing upright stake in the ground. 
So I'm not reluctant to say cross anymore. Uh, it was used in pagan times, but there are a lot of things pagans do. They worshiped uh, in pagan times. They bowed their face down to the ground in pagan, in, in pagan worship. Uh, they, they, they do all kinds of things. They wear wedding rings, okay? They do a lot of things. Does that mean we shouldn't do anything that they did? No, 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 I don't believe that at all. So I'm going to be saying cross. If you want to translate that in your mind to state, once in a while I might say state because it's a habit. But I believe it was a cross, a cross beam. So there's so much more in part one. Um, and I would be um, amazed if you're in a conservative Sabbath-keeping church, if they even ever talk about this. But Paul's message was broad. I even had somebody say to me, uh, why not just forget the instrument of death and just talk about what he did on it? Well, that's fine, except the example that Paul gave us was not that. The example that Paul gave us was that he said uh, a lot about Christ, the Lamb of God, the Passover Lamb, the blood of Christ, and all that it does. But he also gave so many scriptures talking about boasting in and talking about the cross, the instrument of death. To him, it was not something to be ashamed of. In fact, he states very clearly, I am not ashamed of the gospel, the good news of Christ. I am not ashamed of it. Now, I'm covering this, remember, just before Passover, a month or so, a month and a half, and there's still too many of you who ne don't mention ever mention the stake or the cross. And if, uh, if uh, so I hope I can help you get over that. And let's start talking about, if you, wanna, if you prefer to say the stake, fine, but talk about it. Just talk about it. And that's what Paul is saying. And that's what I'm saying. That's what Scripture is saying. Let's follow the examples and urgings of Scripture. Now, besides the newest historical evidence uh, that showed most of the time, many times, it was definitely a cross beam. They even put a notch in the upright uh, so the cross beam could fit in easily without a lot of work. We also showed you last time in the, uh, I'm not going to repeat the whole sermon, but just a couple points here, how in the lintel, I mean the Passover, the first Passover recorded in Exodus 12, God told them, put a splash of the lamb's blood above your head as you'd be coming in the door, the lintel, and on the side post. And I believe that if it, if, if it had simply been that Christ was going to be crucified like this, up hands above his head, I believe God would have told them, just put a lot of blood just on top there to cover the blood coming from his head and his hands. But that's not what he said. He said from the head and the side post. Because that's where our Savior put his arms out wide, the camera wide, <laughs> like that, real wide, as he welcomes us into his being, into his person, to forgive us of our sins. I love you this much kind of a thing, you see? And then the shape of the camp of Israel, to me that was very, very intriguing. Very, very intriguing. Metzger and others have been pioneering in, in developing that from Numbers chapter 2. Uh, it's very clear in Numbers 2. We'll put up a picture first of the whole camp uh, looking down from Mount Sinai as it would have looked to someone up in, um, up in the hills looking down, or any of the hills. It doesn't have to be Mount Sinai. But also, let's put up another one here showing the numbers involved. And you'll see that the, the camp of Judah, symbolized by the lion, the lion of Judah, Judah and then the other two tribes that were with it, was by far the longest part. That would be the upright stake. And then, uh, and then the top part of that would have been, I believe, Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin. Smaller total. And so the cross beam going across would have been, in other words, it didn't look like a cross. Just a, I'm sorry, it didn't look like a plus. It looked like a cross, not a plus. And did you notice also, if we still have that white one, the white illustration, uh, that the symbols of each of the four uh, divisions, each division had three tribes in it, uh, were the lion, the man, the eagle, and the ox. So the leading tribe in each of those four groupings, Reuben would have been the man, and lion, I believe, would be Judah, and then the eagle, I believe, would have been Dan. It was also represented by a serpent, but they, they used the eagle as well. And the ox, I believe, would have been Ephraim. Okay, so... Uh, if you'll note, those are the same characteristics of the four living creatures or four uh, beasts or four living creatures that surround or, or around the, the throne of God in heaven. 
the lion, man, eagle, and ox. Why? Because right in the middle of all this was the ark that was in the tabernacle, right in the middle of all where these would come together. And that's where the tribe of Levi and uh, the, 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 the priests and the Levites would have camped. And then right around them would be symbols of an eagle and an ox and a lion and a man, depicting what is up above. I just wanted you to note that. David told us about it in Psalm 23, verses 16 to 18, that, uh, what did he say? They have pierced my, my hands and my feet. I can see all of my bones. They cast lots for my, maybe we could even post that whole scripture as I'm talking about it, if you can. Uh, they cast lots for my garments. All of that happened. Psalm 22, verses 16 to 18. Also, we talked about how the, uh, in the Greek, you're familiar with the term Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. In the Hebrew, that would have been, he would have said, I'm the Aleph Tav. The Aleph being the first letter, Tav being the last letter. The symbol of the last letter in Hebrew is, it looks like a T, like a cross. It really does. And it meant a sign, a mark. Some say it meant the co covenant as well. So all of these indications to me, when God said in Ezekiel 9 to put a mark on those who sigh and cry for the iniquities, the abominations in the land, he was saying put a sign of, a, of the Tav, which is, looked like a cross. So all of that tells me God is not ashamed of the cross, not at all. Even though that horrible symbol of death to us, it becomes a glorious symbol and we're not ashamed of it. So I'll be saying the cross from now on. And I ended the last sermon by talking about how God the Father, uh, part one, how God the Father, could we might well hear, hear him say, look, because of what my son did and what you accepted from my son and his sacrifice, you are no longer sentenced to death. You are no longer under the death penalty. All your sin penalty has been paid in full by him. And you accepted that. He accepted that. And so you are no longer sentenced to die. You are sentenced to eternal life. I give you eternal life in and through my son. And um, I just love that. So let's pick up now from Galatians 6.14 again. And um, uh, God forbid, we're going to come back to the context of that in just a minute. God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus, by whom the world has been crucified to me. Hey, the world means nothing to me now. Nothing. We're pioneers. We're sojourners in this land. It should mean nothing to us. And I to the world, he says, Paul's not boasting about himself here. He's boasting about the cross of our Lord because it says in Jeremiah 9, 24, and before that it actually says, if you're a strong man, don't boast in your strength. If you're a wise man, don't boast in being wise. Do this, Jeremiah 9, 24. Let him who glories glory in this. This is what I want you to be glory in. God says that he understands and knows me. When Paul says in Philippians 3, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. That's what Paul said his priority was. That you know me, that I'm Yehovah, I'm the Lord, I'm Yehovah, exercising loving kindness, judgment, righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight. Loving kindness, judgment, righteousness. Because that's who I am. I am love. I am righteousness. I am kind. That's what God says. Anyway, but death by the cross or stake would have been very, very shameful. And if you had a brother, a father, an uncle, or somebody who had uh, died by crucifixion, I doubt that many people would be bragging about it. Because that would mean that you were guilty of treason, or you were the lowest of criminals, or uh, that you were a terrible slave. Whatever it was, it was reserved for the worst. And Paul says he loves talking, not just about Yeshua, but both Yeshua and, and the cross. Let's start talking about it more. All of you hearing this, let's start talking about it more. Whatever church group you're in. 1 Corinthians 1.18, Paul says that he loves the message of the cross for it's the power of God to those who are being saved. 1 Corinthians 1.18. 1 Corinthians 2.2. 2, I am determined, this should be up there, not to know anything among you. I don't care about talking about anything else except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Are we there? 
We like to get into doctrines about all kinds of things, majoring in the minors. The major is Christ and him crucified. So my first point in boasting about glorying in the cross is start doing it. Start talking about it. We're so good about talking about the Lamb of God, which is great, about the blood of Christ, which is great. Paul says, talk about the cross as well. Just start doing it. Start talking about it. You know, when you love someone, really love someone, it's easy to boast about that person. I remember going to a track meet uh, many years ago, and this woman's son, probably about 14 or 15 years old, was in this track meet, and he was running way ahead of everybody else. And the, 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 the guy's mother was here sitting behind us in the bleachers. And she just stood up with glee and joy. That's my son. That's my son. That's my son. And he won the, the race easily. And she sat down. You could feel her beaming behind her, behind me, even though I couldn't see her yet. So I turned around and I said, uh, was that your son? <laughs> she said, yeah, that was my son. I said, I, I, I think I could tell. You're very proud of him. So you should be. Well, Yeshua is my brother. That's my brother. That's my king. That's my Lord. That's my master. Yes, I'll boast about him and his cross. Now, 1 Corinthians 15, Paul was so happy about the message of his death and resurrection. And from now on, I'm going to talk about boasting not just in the cross, but in the power that cross gives us in the resurrection of Yeshua and Jesus. See verses uh, 1 to 3, especially in 1 Corinthians 15. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel. This is the good news that I preach to you. I know the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of Christ, the gospel of God, the gospel of peace. All of these gospels and more. Paul said to the Corinthians, I'm going to tell you the gospel I told you. That I talked about. I'll declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, verse 1, which you also received and by which you stand, by which you are saved. If you hold fast that word which I preach to you, you have to endure to the end. You have to hold fast. But you're as good as saved if you hang on. It's what he says here. It's what Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9 say. For you have been saved by grace, and we're being saved, and we shall be saved. But yes, we also have been saved if we hang on to the end. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I received. That Christ came to bring the kingdom of God to the earth eventually. No, he says, Christ died for our sins. This is the gospel I preach to you, he says, according to the scriptures. And that he was buried. And that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. Seen by Cephas, Peter, and by the twelve. The full gospel includes, of course, the kingdom of God, includes all of that. But we have to include the door into that kingdom. Yeshua said, I am the door, John 10, I think verse 7 and 9. I am the door to the sheep. I am the door to the sheepfold. And, um, and entering that kingdom is made possible because of the cross and the resurrection. Turn to Acts 20, verse 24. Does your group teach this a lot about the gospel? Acts 20, 24, none of these things move me. He was just, go back and get the context. He was told that uh, hardships and trials await you no matter where you go. And he says, that's fine. Uh, Christ suffered for me. I can suffer for him. So none of these things move me, Acts 20, 24. Nor do I count my life dear to myself that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify, to testify. See, I use Jesus and Yeshua both, okay? To testify to the gospel, the good news of the grace of God. I even had a minister write me and say, there's no such gospel of grace. You can't find it. I said, that's because you're not looking it up in the concordance under gospel of the grace of God. Acts 20, 24. It's there. Let's leave it, leave it up. I want to talk to you about the gospel of the grace of God. I have some sermons recently but understanding this wonderful favor and grace that God gives us. Paul was so in love with his Savior and his actions that nothing else seemed to matter. Isn't that the way it is? When you love someone, something or a cause or 
when you really love someone, nothing else matters nearly so much. You'll go to the ends of the world for that person. If you asked me for the moon, I'd go and get it. Wasn't that one of the songs? Okay. You know some of the words to a song? It's impossible. You're deeply in love. So you'll speak often of the one you love. You'll speak often of Christ. You'll speak often of what he did on the cross. Because the cross is the anchor to that message. To boast in the cross means we're so awed by the cross and what happened on it. We're so awed by it that we can't stop talking about it. We bring it up. We bring it up. We're frequently talking about it. Look at Acts 26, verses 14 to 15 in the complete Jewish Bible this time. Paul was called by Yeshua, by Jesus. Yeshua is his Hebrew name. While on the road to Damascus to capture and, and tie up Christians, men, women, children, whoever they were, and even condemn them to death, he says, in a couple places. Terrible things that Paul, who was called Saul in his Hebrew name, Shaul. And this is what he says, that when he was struck down by that light on the way to Damascus, you can read the story earlier in the book of Acts, we all fell to the ground. And then I heard a voice saying to me in Hebrew, there's some who actually teach Hebrew wasn't even spoken or known back then, that they all spoke Aramaic. That's just simply not true. Remember, even the sign that Pilate put above Yeshua was written in Greek, Hebrew, and Latin. So they spoke Hebrew. Jesus certainly spoke Hebrew. A voice speaking to me in Hebrew saying, Shaul, Shaul, which is Saul, Saul, why do you keep persecuting me? Paul was his Greek name, means little. Why are you persecuting me? It's hard for you to keep kicking against the ox goads, the pricks, the ox goads. I've been goading you, Paul. What's the matter with you? Why aren't you responding? And I said, who are you, Lord? Who are you, sir? And the Lord answered, speaking in Hebrew, remember. So he would have used everything Hebrew here. I am Yeshua, and you are persecuting me. So when Jesus, when our Savior, spoke in Hebrew, he used the word, the name Mama called him. He used the name the angel told his Mama to call him. That name is Yeshua. And when you understand, it means salvation. And dozens and dozens of scriptures in the Old Testament, in the Tanakh, the Hebrew scriptures, says something about for you are my Yeshua. You are my salvation. And we would miss all that. The Jews would have missed all that. They used any other name other than Yeshua while reading their own scriptures. And when he said, my name is, I am, he said, I'm Yeshua. So please don't begrudge me if once in a while I say Yeshua, or sometimes I'll say Jesus, to you Filipinos or even any of the Hispanic people. It's Jesus. That's fine. But he said, my name, I am Yeshua. In Acts 20, so I, I can use the name he said his name was, right? Acts 26, verse 17 and 18. I'm going to continue now the New King James. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as the Gentiles. To whom I now send you. Here's what I want you to do, Paul. He says, Saul, to open their eyes. To order the, in order to turn them from darkness to light. And from the power of Satan to God. From the power of Satan to God. Tell them about my cross is really what he's saying here. Because at that cross, I knocked Satan out. From having hold on you, my people. That they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified, made holy by faith. You're not made holy by what you do. You're made holy by faith in Yeshua. In salvation. So start saying Yeshua to yourselves. It's a wonderful name. We are, it's the name he said his, was his name. We are made righteous and made holy by faith in, 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 in Yeshua. Not by all the things we do, which lends me to the second point. The first point is just start doing it. Start talking about it. Start boasting about it. Just start doing it. Not just what he did, 
but also what he did it on because it's the symbol of it all. The second point is the context of Galatians 6, 14 tells us don't focus on what you're doing for righteousness. Foc don't focus on what you're doing for righteousness. Focus on what I did for you for righteousness. So here's Galatians 6, 12 to 15. The first couple of verses in 12 and 13, he's saying a lot of people are coming to you, Galatians, and saying, hey, you men, you've got to get circumcised because um, that way we won't have to suffer persecution because, they'll, okay, at least they're circumcised, so leave them alone. Verse 13, but not even those who are circumcised keep the law, but they desire to have, have you circumcised that they may boast in what you've done in your flesh. See, a lot of these men are so zealous they're even willing to be circumcised. Paul says you're boasting in what you're doing. God forbid, there's, that's the context, God forbid I should boast except in the cross, what God did for me. The cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. It is true that the Greek for Jesus is Jesus, very similar to our English word Jesus. I reject those who say that uh, Jesus is a form of Zeus, and we shouldn't use it. I'm not afraid to say Jesus, Jesus, or Latin is Jesus, more like the Spanish way of saying it. But he said Yeshua, <laughs> salvation. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything. He says all these things you think you're doing for righteousness sake means nothing, frankly. Because we don't need to be circumcised in the new covenant. We have circumcision of the, of the heart, not of the flesh down below, but of the heart. He said, what matters now in verse 15, circumcision avails nothing but a new creation. What counts is that Christ is making you a new creation. Talk about what he is doing. Now, you and I do not create anything new creation. We don't. We cooperate with it, we obey, but we don't cause our own new creation. Let's read it, 2 Corinthians 5, 16 to 18, especially verse 17. There's one creator, it's God. He created all things we see and he's creating the new creation as well in you and me. You don't create your own new creation. I want you to really get that. This is what matters. Okay, notice here, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 16. From now on, quit thinking of people the way they were before they came to Christ. That's what verse 16 says. Or quit thinking of people of the sins that they have done that have since been forgiven, washed away. Stop. Stop. That's what verse 16 is saying. Verse 17, if anyone is in Christ, is if anyone is in Christ. I want you to notice that phrase, in Christ. Sometime soon, I'm going to plan to update my 2008 three sermons about what it means to be in Christ. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. All that old stuff that you did that were wrong and sinful and forgiven and washed away and people want to bring up and separate very friends by their evil whispering. That's not grace. Those of you doing that, you don't know grace. You don't know it. You're not practicing it. You need to stop doing that. You need to bring people together and not be talking about something you heard about somebody, whether that's me or anybody else. It's not grace. You know you know grace if you're living it. Let's stop it. Let's live grace, favor for one another, bring each other together to Christ. Okay, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Old things have passed away. Don't allow someone to gossip to you. You become uh, someone participating in that crime. Don't let someone dig in the, in the blood of Christ that has covered all those sins. Now all these things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation, not gossip, not abandonment, not that. All things are of God. He's our focus. Verse 
18 again. All things are of God. All things of value. Yeshua is where I should be fixed. God is the creator of all things, including this new creation. We're not creating our, old, our new self. It's God's work. And that work can only be possible by the cross and the resurrection that he went through by God the Father. Boast in that. That's the wonderful, wonderful, amazing God and Savior we have. So when we talk about the cross, be sure you also talk about the resurrection. They go together. The glorying is in both. The good news is in both. Like Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, how he died for our sins and was resurrected the third day. You can't come up with a more selfless act than the cross for everybody else. It's such a horribly painful death. That's where we get the word excruciating pain. Excruciating meaning the kind of pain you'd suffer on a cross. In his cross, we see the Son of God crucified, bringing bright hope to all of us, bringing bright hope to the whole world as God opens their mind to see it. Hopefully they respond. We believers see release from sin's captive, captivity bondage on us. We experience the love of God who loved us while we're still sinners, while we're still hurting his Son. I'll bet if we actually saw a real crucifixion, we would understand all this so much more. There are, they're still doing crucifixions. The ISIS group did crucifixions in Iraq and made the family watch. This guy who was working with the anti-ISIS forces as they crucified him slowly, painfully. I doubt any of us fully appreciate or comprehend what happened on that stake 2,000 years ago. But I am trying to comprehend that I must trust him, love him, and speak of him because he who took away all the guilt that I had brought on myself, and so have you, and it hasn't been washed away and made me new in him. Hallelujah. Praise you, Yeshua. Praise you. Praise you, God our Father. Many of you are coming to the site <clears throat> from Brazil, Kenya, China, Philippines, even North and South Korea, Israel, Middle East, Middle Eastern countries. I want you to remember that when Christ had to carry his beam, his cross beam, he had lost so much blood from the scourging the night before. At some point, he just didn't have the strength to keep carrying it. And so they asked Simon of Cyrene. Simon of Cyrene could have been a Jew. There are many Jews in Cyrene, which is North Africa. More likely, though, I believe he probably was a black man. And I bring that up only because the cross is for everybody. If you're Filipino, Chinese, Indonesian, if you're Brazilian, Mexican, Canadian, English, European, African, Kenyan, Nigerian, South African, doesn't matter. He died for you too. He died for you too. And I think that's partly pictured by Simon of Cyrene carrying that crossbeam. Seems like he had two sons in the church, Rufus and somebody else that are mentioned. But anyway, let's look now at some of the final thoughts that I want to share with you about Jesus' last moments. Isaiah 53, 7 says he was led like a lamb for the slaughter. Now, I'm told, I hope it's true. Well, first, let me say this. In the Philippines, where I grew, we had turkeys and ducks, and we had, my dad had some pigs. We didn't have sheep and lambs in the Philippines. But whenever somebody tried to kill a pig, that crazy pig would start squealing before he even got near it. Certainly, he saw the knife, and if he started to feel it, that pig would squeal, screaming. Of course, they know they're going to be killed. My understanding is that lambs don't do that. They just don't. Somehow I believe the same for our Messiah. He did shout out, finished, perfect, perfected, done, while on the cross. Once we accept Yeshua as your life now, which it should be, I want the power of his resurrection, Paul said in Ephesians 3, I mean Philippians 3, we're part of him. All kinds of wondrous things will begin to happen in your understanding. I need to give the whole sermon on being in him, so I won't get di di distracted by that now, but it's such a big point. 
Jeremiah, John, John chapter 10. Translate for me if I say the wrong chapter or wrong person. It's just I'm trying so hard to be the cameraman and the, the notes and the lights and everything else and think of everything coming up. So just I, I, once in a while I make a mistake. Just once in a while, though. <laughs> Let's recall some points we can be boasting about. Yeshua said, Father and I talked this through. God in the Word. And before there was even a creation of mankind, before the foundation of the world, it says in, uh, where does it say that? It says in First Peter someplace that he was killed from before the foundation of the world. Other places say from the foundation. Certainly by the time Adam and Eve actually sinned, from that point forward, he was as good as dead. But what I'm getting at here in John 10, verses 17 and 18, I'll put it up. John 10, 17, 18. It's, years ago, I used to think God told the word, okay, you got to go and die for all of them. It'll be hard for both of us, but that's your job. That's not what John 10 says. John 10, verse 17 and 18 uh, says that it was his choice. It was Yeshua's choice. Therefore, my father loves me because I lay down. I lay down my life that I may take it again. I can lay it down. I can change my mind. That's what he's saying here. No one takes it from me, not even God the Father. No one. It's my choice. But I lay down of myself. I have power, I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it again. This command I've received from my Father. So Father says, God says to the Word, it's up to you. We can do this, but it's going to be your choice. You can decide to do it. You can even change your mind. It's up to you. And that's, I want you to understand that. It was up to him. So up until the last second before they started scourging and nailing him, he could have stopped it all and he did not. I boast in him for that. I stand in awe, knowing what I know about crucifixions. I stand in awe over that. Romans 5, verses 6 to 10. Paul summarizes it this way. Romans 5, verses 6 to 10. This is such a rich, rich source of verses. For when, when we were still without strength in due time, Christ means the anointed, same word as the Hebrew Messiah, Messiah or Mashiach, died for the ungodly. He died for us while we were still bad. For scarcely a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps a good man, someone would even dare to die. God demonstrates his own love for us that in while we were still sinners, we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I want you to get this. He died for the high priest and the priest and the people walking by, spitting on him and saying nasty things and, and taunting him. If you're really the son of God, come down off the cross. He died for them too. He died for you in the worst sin you've ever done. In all of the sins you've ever done. They're not bad enough that his, that his blood can't cover them. If you turn to him and repent, give them all to your Savior. Let him take it from you. He died for us while we're still sinners. That's verse 8. Verse 9 now, Romans 5, 9. Much more than having now been justified, been declared righteous because he took away all the sins, been justified by his blood, which paid the penalty for all of that. The wages of sin is death, not eternal life, being tortured in hell fire. It's death. It's death. We shall be saved from wrath through him. When we sin, we incurred the wrath of God on us for our sins. And so when all of our wrath that we had incurred was put on Yeshua, yeah, he suffered an awful lot, an awful lot for that. And if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God, through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his resurrection, by his life. You got to put the death and the resurrection, the death and the life together here. The power of the cross is in that resurrection later, that we, he now comes and lives again in us. So that now we should have millions, millions, at least thousands and thousands of Yeshua's walking the earth. If you're letting him, and if I'm letting him live in me, and to so the point where like Yeshua said, remember what Yeshua said? Every word I speak, everything I do, that's not me. 
These are God's, it's God the Father's words and deeds that I'm doing. The works I do are His works. I'm not here you know, to do my own thing, do my own will. I'm here to do the will of my Father. If we would learn that too, and let Yeshua shine through us, what a magnificent example we would be, and we certainly wouldn't be late of sin. But anyway, it's very, very important that we understand what it's saying here, the, the power of what uh, Yeshua did. Paul also said in Philippians 3, uh, verses, at the end of verse 8 to the, through 11, that he didn't care about all the things he had done. He had actually earlier in Philippians 3 had listed all the wonderful things about him. And he says, you know what? I count that all a bunch of dung. All I care about is, now pick it up, Philippians 3, 8, the end of it. All I want is to gain Christ, be found in him. Here's that phrase again, in him. What does that mean, to be found in him? There are also verses about being found in God. Not having my own righteousness. I don't want my own righteousness. Please see that. Which is from the law. From my things I got to do. I don't want him to see that. What I want, he says, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God by faith. You see, the righteousness by faith is the righteousness of God that he gives to us if we would just believe it, accept it, and then let Christ live in us obediently. It doesn't mean we can go out and do what we want. But neither should you be counting on, oh, I've got to do this, I've got to do that, and I'm failing so much here, failing so much there. I'll talk more about how we overcome those things. It's not by looking at the sins we still have. That's the wrong view. You become what you think about. Philippians, I mean, Proverbs 23, 7, I think, says that. We'll get to that in a minute. But anyway, he says, I want the righteousness from God, which is by faith, that I may know him, Philippians, Philippians 3. You know if I say Proverbs, I mean Philippians and vice versa, right? <laughs> that I may know him and the power of his Resurrection. Notice he doesn't say the power of the resurrection. And the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Our entire eternity starts with this understanding and loving the cross and the resurrection of Christ by God the Father. Let's recount some more of what happened with Christ. Yeshua was very intent on what was going to happen this day, very intent on getting it done. Uh, he was ready to rumble, as we say today. He was ready to rumble. Although there was a natural dread, even fear and distress that came upon him while in the Garden of Gethsemane temporarily. Three times. Father, is there any other way we could, do I have to drink this cup? And the answer each time was, that's the deal we made. Yes, you have to. I'll be, you know, he sent angels to comfort him and all that. But in this particular time, as he prayed in Gethsemane, uh, Satan had captured all of humanity from Adam and Eve onwards, except those that God had called out of that into his family, like Abraham and Enoch and so on. And so he was slain from before the foundation because he knew that humans would not be able to be sinless. He just knew it. Any of you who think you can be sinless yourselves, you're better than Paul, I guess, who said that that which I hate, I still do sometimes. Better than me, better than all of us. We can't do it ourselves. We have to have that righteousness by faith. So 1 Peter 1.18 uh, to 20 says that he was slain from before the foundation of the world. And when you love someone, really, really love them, really love them, Nothing much else happens, matters, I mean. And you also know when you really love someone, if you really open yourself up to somebody, sooner or later they're going to hurt you. You, you. you might even hurt them. But sooner or later they are going to hurt you and you have to learn to love them anyway. And that's what God knew. That even though I send my son to die for all of them in a brutal death, they are going to kill him. They are going to hurt him. They're going to reject him, abandon him. I know that feeling. Some of you know that feeling. And Christ knows that feeling. This whole nation abandoned him. His own disciples fled 
in the Garden of Gethsemane after Peter hacked off Malchus's ear. But they realize, God and the Word realize as one, even before mankind was created, that there would have to be a crucifixion. They'd have to show their love by being brutally killed, tortured, way back then. At the Passover meal in John 13, we see some more of this eagerness from Christ. He had already said, John 13, 26 to 27, when he said, one of you is going to betray me, then Peter asked John, to, who was leaning on Jesus' bosom, to say, uh, they weren't at a table, by the way. Forget this Michelangelo uh, painting. They weren't, they weren't all sitting at a table. No, they're all reclining down. Okay, on a pillow. And John, the youngest there, uh, had his head on Jesus' shoulder or, shoulder or bosom. And so he said, Who is it, Lord? And he said, It is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread when I've dipped it. Having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. I'm reading John 13, verses 26 and 27. To Judas. Now, after the piece of bread, Satan, adversary, enemy, serpent, dragon, Satan entered him, and Yeshua said to him, What you do, do quickly. He wasn't talking to Judas now at this point. He's talking to Satan directly. What you do, enemy, go do it. It's time to rumble. Because Yeshua could still sin between now and his death. He could still, Satan could, if successful, stop the whole plan of salvation still. We read some of the strength in Jesus' words, knowing the stage has been set now to rumble, to get going. John 13, verse 30, Having received a piece of bread, he then went out immediately, Satan and Judas, and it was night. Yeah, it was a dark time. So when he'd gone out, Jesus said, Now, now the Son of Man is glorified. Son of Man. He didn't say Son of God here. Son of Man. I'm going to take on the most powerful, demonic, smartest, conniving, brilliant spirit being in hand-to-hand -hand combat. He's going to try to get into my head, and I must not let him do that. But So I know, I'm looking forward to it, now that they've gone. The Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. I see a lot of power in those words. And remember that Adam, after Adam and Eve sinned, humanity came under Satan's control. He becomes the God of this age, God of this world. 2 Corinthians 4 4, he's the spirit of the power of the air. Uh, though God still has restraints on him, he, he can't do just anything he wants. God still has ultimate control, especially when it involves his people, his people as in the story of Job. But boy, did God give Satan a long leash on that one. Did everything possible except kill Job and his wife. So John 8, 44, don't forget that Jesus said to the Jews who were not being kind of snarly to him, you are of your father the devil and the desires of your father you want to do. So remember that there were the seed of the serpent, and the seed of Adam and Eve. And God said to the Adam and Eve, your seed, pointing to Christ, will crush, the seed will crush his head. Okay? Will crush Satan's head. Now the wages of sin is death. I don't mean the seed of Satan. I mean Satan himself. The wages of sin is death. It's real death. Malachi 4, verse 2 and 3 says, the unrighteous, the wicked, will become as ashes under the feet of the righteous, as ashes. This false teaching out there that the wages of sin is eternal life being tortured by a loving God in hell fire. It's false. The wages of sin is death, not eternal separation from God as you live in torture. I'll sometime have to talk about that and proving that. There is a hell fire, but it burns you up to, to where you're ashes. So Yeshua came to pay your penalty, our lives, and to give us a door to make us leave Satan as being our father, so that God now becomes our father. Satan battled Christ and tried to deal the death blow and lost. 
And though Yeshua was also God, remember John 1, the first three verses, the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, John 1 and to 3. And also where um, uh, Thomas, Thomas says to Yeshua, to Jesus after the resurrection, he didn't see him the first time when he came. And he, when he finally saw this was really the resurrected Jesus, he said, my Lord and my God realized that the human named Jesus was now taken on, this Satan, brilliant strategist, that Genesis 3 was more cunning, more bright, more, more powerful and shrewd than all the, uh, anything else God had ever created. This would be a, bit, a vicious battle of temptations going on constantly. They were going to try to make him doubt, and he put these thoughts in the people walking by. If you're the Son of God, come down off that cross. But Yeshua won. And because he won, I can boast about him and his cross. His cross. I can boast about that victory. He crushed Satan's head at the place called Golgotha, the place of the skull. Some think it was a place in the bottom of uh, Mount of Olives, near, uh, near the bottom, uh, near the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, where they would count people as they came across into the area of Jerusalem. Could well be that that was where Gethsemane, I mean, where um, Golgotha was. To me, the main point I'm focusing on is the meaning, place of the skull, tying that back to Genesis 3, verse 15. Your seed shall crush the serpent's skull. It happened at Golgotha. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Praise your Father. Jesus, when, that all, when they all came to arrest him in Gethsemane, Peter thought, okay, I'm not going to be a coward here. He whips out his sword and whacks off, probably trying to cut off the Malchus's head. The guy probably ducked and he ends up slicing off the ear. Yeshua gives us an insight into what was happening in the spiritual realm. No doubt at that moment, the sky, the air was filled with invisible spirits, both good and bad. Both good and bad. I'll tell you, there were thousands and thousands of demons around at that point, probably infecting and in a lot of these people coming to arrest him and all over the place. But there was something else. Yeshua says in Matthew 26, verse 53, he could probably see this. He, he could see an, an angelic battle going on. There's angelic battle going around you a lot of the time. He said, Peter, put that away. Those who want to live by the sword shall die by the sword. And then he says, don't you think that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels. There's about up to 6,000 in, in a Roman legion. Peter, don't you think I could just say angels? And God's elite, battle-hardened, battle-ready, Angelic seals, if you will, the Navy seals. The very best. With spirit swords drawn, ready for action. If he said, okay, I'm not going through this. Angels! Boom! 72,000 or more. More than, he said, would suddenly have appeared. I guarantee you all who came to arrest Jesus would have fled, would have fainted. So would the demons. But Jesus said, I got to go through this battle. I got to go through it for those I love. Because the cross of Jesus was about this fight with Satan. And in this fight, he crushed his skull. He overcame him and he freed us from under Satan's grasp and opened the door. He is the door. I am the door. I'm the bread of life. I'm the good shepherd. I'm the sheep. I'm the lamb. He was ready for that battle, ready to get it done, ready for him to show his love for all of us. It's in the cross that we see the love of Messiah in its greatest clarity. So let's please start talking about it much more openly. Much more openly. I still think that Satan knew the plans of God and he shall see my hands and feet that are pierced and, and, the, and the, the symbol in the door going, you know, in, in Exodus 12 and the, the shape of the uh, tribe of Israel, tribes of Israel. I think Satan made that a, 
a pagan design as well to confuse us. I'm not confused anymore, and I don't want you to be confused anymore. Whether it was a stake, an X, a tree, a cross, a T-beam, whatever, speak of it. Speak of it. At the cross, we see the love of our Messiah more clearly than on anything else. We see his love all through the gospel accounts of all the many things he did, the healings, the multiplying the loaves and fish, the walking on the water, the calming the storm, all the wonderful things he did. But at the cross, his love ran red. As Chris Tomlin says in his song, At the Cross, as it splashed and dripped down that ugly, horrible beam, that horrible stake, that horrible cross, to the cursed ground below, that when God cursed the ground to Adam and Eve, now he was opening it up in the new covenant. That blood touched the ground, changed it. And that horrible cross now became a beautiful, wonderful, beautiful instrument of salvation and life, forgiveness, becoming children of God. Boast in it! Talk about it! While we're still sinners, he spread out his arms, okay? He spread out his arms wide and invited you to come in. We owe all to you, Jesus, Father. We owe everything to you. We stand in awe of you. In his open arms, he saves us, he protects us, forgives us. He brings us back to the Father's embrace, into the Father's presence. Remember, Adam and Eve were shooed out of the Garden of Eden. Although God still talked to them, he even still talked to Cain. He said, Cain, if you get on top of your thoughts, you'll be fine. But if you don't, sin lies at the door. Cain sinned, killed his brother. At that point, we read that Cain went out from the presence of God. God is so incredible. He's there. All the spiritual adulteries that the nation of Israel and Judah did against God and he still in Hosea and many other places says, come back to me. Even though you've been like a harlot, I will still bring you back. And they would not. So now Abba is our father just like it was his father because of his cross and resurrection. So let's go outside the camp. Let's go to Hebrews 13 now. Because of Yeshua, Son of God, we can now come into the very presence of God Hebrews 13, verses 12 to 15, Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify, make holy the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Therefore, let's go forth to him, outside the gate, outside the camp, bearing his reproach. We can carry our own cross out there. We can identify with that, bearing his reproach. We're not ashamed to talk about his cross. The cross. Not just the stake, but if that's what you believe, at least talk about the stake then. For here we have no continuing city. We seek one to come. It's not about this life. It's not about the kind of car you drive, the kind of house you have, the kind of money you have. It's not about all the fun places you're going. We are sojourners. Don't forget that. We have no continuing city here. Therefore, verse 15, let us by him continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God, that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. How can we benefit from the cross? The biggest thing is Hebrews 12, verse 2, NIV. Let us fix, fix, focus our eyes on Jesus. On Jesus, the author and perfecter or finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. If you and I ever have to go through the great tribulation because we didn't qualify to we weren't counted worthy to escape these things like Luke 21, 36 says. We weren't counted worthy to. Well, I hope that you will look forward beyond the pain and suffering you will have to go through in the Great Tribulation. Remember that verse. Better yet, let's be counted worthy to escape now. Let's get rid of any late Essenism. Endured the cross, scorning its shame. Sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. Quit focusing on the money you've saved up. Quit focusing on your investments. Focus on him. So we fix our eyes on Jesus. I love this one coming up here. 2 Corinthians 13, 17 to 18. The Lord is the Spirit. 
If you have sins to overcome, don't focus on the sin. That'll just make it worse. Paul says so. He says, he says in the Romans 7, verses 7 to 10, I didn't know about coveting until I read about it in the law. Now, whenever I think of coveting, I want to do it. It's made it worse. So what I'm trying to do is look to Christ. Don't look at the problem. Look at the solution. Focus on the solution. Don't look at the waves if you decide to walk out of the boat and walk with Christ. Look on Christ. As soon as Peter looked at the waves, he sank. If you have a problem with alcohol, drinking, overeating, sex, lust, breaking the Sabbath, whatever it is, using God's name in vain, don't try to overcome those by focusing on them. Focus on Christ. Let him live in you, and he will clean that out of you. He will do it, not you. 2 Corinthians 13, 17, 17 to 18, as you'll see, the Lord is the Spirit. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord. That's what you're looking at. The glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. How? By focusing on the glory of the Lord. That's what transforms us. We're being transformed to be just like him, his image, as by the Spirit of the Lord. Focus on that, not on the sins, because what we fix our mind on is what we become. What did Yeshua himself say? Abide in me, and I in you. Abide in me, and you will bear much fruit. John 15, 5. I'm the vine, you're the branches. The vine has no, the, the, the branch has no life by itself, but if the branch abides in the vine, it will bear much fruit. Stay attached. Stay with him. Pray often, day and night. Constant contact. Sure, the formal prayers on your knees, if you can still knee, kneel. But if you can't kneel, bow your head and sit. I know we're all getting older. And then throughout the day, constant contact, the Father and Yeshua. Don't focus on the sin. They'll just make it worse. Don't think about a pink elephant. A pink elephant. Do not picture a pink elephant. Do not. See what you did? You pictured a pink elephant. Focus on Yeshua, and he will clean you up. Start, time to start wrapping this up. I promise you, sooner or later, uh, hopefully sooner than later, I'll be talking about being in Christ. That's the key to being able to apply to everything I've just said. Focusing on him. We have to be in him. We are in him by, by baptism of the Holy Spirit into his body. That's, that's into the church. That's true. But there's far more to it than that. So when you answer God's call, you repent of it. You repent of everything you've been, everything you are. Turn yourself over. Surrender. Total surrender to his will. Total. Total. That's what we're not doing. So at the cross of Jesus, I want you to look up the, 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 there's a song by Chris Tomlin called At the Cross, Your Love Ran Red. I'll put the link in the notes, but maybe we can uh, on the screen up here too. Well, no, just look it up. At the cross, your love ran red. At the cross of Jesus, sin and shame are powerless. At the cross of Jesus, death because of our sin is powerless the cross of Jesus, of Yeshua, we have peace. As we stand in awe of him and his cross, give up our life for him, the way Chris Tomlin sings it, as his blood ran red and our sins made white by his red blood. Something like that. I like the song. You may not like the song or the singer, uh, but I, I did. Let's close. Holy Father, Holy Father in heaven, we thank you for sending your eternal word to come and love on us by doing everything to bring us back to you. He stretched his arms out wide for us from before the foundation of the world and accepted us into you. Even after we all hurt you and all killed you, Yeshua, sinned against you, your own love knew no bounds. Your mercy was evident. We're so appreciative of that. And our God in heaven, you loved us while we're still sinners and ungodly. Yeshua, you came and died for everyone in the world who will accept you. Thank you, Master. Thank you, brother. 
Thank you, King. Thank you, Lion of Judah. We raise holy hands to you as you tell us to do so in one of Paul's writings, I think, in Timothy. I would that men everywhere would raise holy hands in prayer. I'm doing it now, Father. I pray that all watching this will go ahead and do it. Raise holy hands in prayer. An awesome prayer to you. Father in heaven, shine on us, your children. We're reaching out to you. Lift us up in your hands. Give us a big hug and smile. Forgive us our sins and our shortcomings. Help us look to Yeshua. Help us change our lives by focusing on him. Father, we have many people around the world who have claimed Yeshua as their Savior. Teach them your truth. Teach them your, your way. And protect them, Father. We ask especially for those believers who have your spirit in Afghanistan, in North, Af in North Africa, yes, that, there too, North Korea, in um, uh, China. They're being persecuted, Father. Watch out for your children. Keep them from the pandemics. Miraculously, miraculously save them and help them. We raise all this to you. We raise them up to you. We raise them up to you, Father. Dismiss us now and watch over us. Thank you for all your blessings. In Yeshua's mighty name, amen. Visit the Light on the Rock website where you can view additional videos, over 600 sermons and blogs as a scriptural study reference for those who desire to have a closer relationship with God the Father and His Son Jesus Christ and learn more about His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in-depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are greatly appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan Orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting, and if you find the site beneficial to you and your family, please share with others.